Hello and welcome to Earth Optimism 2020. This week marks the 50th anniversary of Earth Day. The Smithsonian Institution and our global partners in the Earth Optimism Alliance are celebrating by shining a spotlight on the extraordinary actions people are taking to conserve and restore our natural world. In these difficult times, conservation needs optimism more than ever to encourage and guide us in our work to secure nature's future. Positive stories will inspire us to make changes in our homes, our communities and our workplaces. And they'll raise our ambitions to scale up conservation solutions so we can make real impacts across the globe. Earth Optimism is a worldwide movement that brings people together to share what's working in conservation and to exchange ideas about how we can make sustainable choices every day. And while nature faces many threats, there is clear and growing evidence that conservation efforts are working right around the world. In China, populations of iconic species such as giant pandas are starting to recover. Renewable energy is expanding and vast new national parks are being created. In the ocean, seagrass beds are regenerating and the numbers of sea turtles and blue whales are on the rise. Across Oceania, communities are bringing together traditional management with contemporary science to improve local stewardship and protect their marine resources. Across Africa, the population of black rhinos is growing and forests are being restored. And here in Kenya, our optimism is about empowering the next generation of conservation leaders. There are literally hundreds of success stories like this. You can discover more through our digital events taking place throughout this week. Do please join in on social media by sharing our own conservation wins using the hashtag EarthOptimism. And by looking out for the physical Earth Optimist celebrations we are now planning for next year. Earth Optimism celebrates these bright spots and it shares our growing understanding of why certain efforts are working and what changes can be made on the ground, in our communities, and way beyond. From wherever you are watching, thank you for tuning in. Hello and welcome to the Earth Optimism Summit 2020. Thank you for joining us for our digital broadcast. My name is Lauren Ward and I'll be one of your hosts coming to you live from the nation's capital, Washington, DC. And I'm Amy Johnson joining you from Rappahannock County, Virginia in the Blue Ridge Mountains. Like many planned gatherings this year, we had anticipated being together in person. We're so pleased that the technology has allowed us to move forward so that we can reach an even larger audience here on EOTV. We're working with a live production crew that's practicing safe social distancing from Hawaii to Los Angeles and across the whole country. Our nearly 100 speakers and panelists will be joining us live as well as from their homes around the world. And my name is Tasha Goldberg. I am joining you from the Philadelphia area. We have an amazing lineup of speakers and content that we are so excited to share with you. We hope that you can join us for every minute. You can look up details on any of our speakers or moderators on our website, where we have included photos and bios for each and every one, earthoptimism.si.edu. Hi there, my name is Kat Kutz, and I will be hosting live from the Washington, D.C. area. I want to take a moment to share with you all the ways you can view our broadcast, as well as the ways you can get involved with the summit and engage with us. Watch us on Twitter, Facebook Live, and through our web portal at earthoptimism.si.edu, and also from our friends on Smithsonian Magazine at smithsonianmag.com. You can get involved by starting conversations online. Use hashtag EarthOptimism so we can see it in reply. I will be online all through the summit to respond to your messages and comments, with a little help, of course. So shout out to my dream team. Emily and Kendall, thank you for your help. We are here to have an ongoing dialogue with hashtag EarthOptimism. So please help us make this the largest global gathering of shared optimism that we can. Now more than ever, we recognize that the world needs 
the global conservation movement has reached a turning point. We've documented the fast pace of habitat loss, the growing number of endangered and extinct species, and the increasing speed of global climate change. Yet while the seriousness of these threats cannot be denied, there are a growing number of examples of improvements in the health of species and ecosystems, along with benefits to human well-being thanks to our conservation actions. Earth optimism celebrates a change in focus from problem to solution, from a sense of loss to one of hope. In the dialogue about conservation and sustainability, we hope that you'll join our conversation learn from one another and help to take whatever actions you can, small or large, to strengthen our global community. Now, before I introduce you to our next speaker, I wanna give a shout out to our sponsors and partners with a special thanks to the Secretary of the Smithsonian, Smithsonian's National Forum, the National Zoo, Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute, HHMI Tanglebank Studios, Roger Sant and the Banff Foundation. And now to help us launch our programming today, it is my sincere pleasure to introduce you to the Secretary of the Smithsonian, Lonnie Bunch. On behalf of the Smithsonian, let me welcome all those who are participating in this summit from across the country and across the globe. We are thrilled to have you join us. I know this is not exactly how we initially planned it, but it's important to the Smithsonian and to me personally that we continue our work and renew our shared sense of purpose. As a historian of 19th century America, I've always been struck by the capacity for hope, even in the grimmest of situations. Crises like this have a way of showing us who we are. In the midst of this pandemic, I have seen our staff, our partners, our communities at the best. We are rising to meet the challenges and showing extraordinary resilience. We're gathering data, applying what we know and equipping the public to stay safe and healthy. That is why I have the utmost faith in the Smithsonian, our partners and our public as we join together to combat one of the greatest challenges of our lifetime, the global climate pandemic. 50 years after the first Earth Day, the future of our planet hangs in the, you know, hangs in the balance. Um, but I know that we can marshal the same creativity and strength that we see around us every day. It's time for us to come together. Earth optimism shows us how we can find hope in the face of odds that may seem overwhelming. It reminds us that change happens when we focus on what works, and when we collaborate to find solutions and celebrate our successes. In moments of fear and uncertainty, we need this perspective more than ever. Over the course of this summit, you hear plenty of reasons for hope. Researchers making breakthroughs in biodiversity, artists leading the way in sustainable design, young people starting local and glowing global. Of course, I don't want to minimize the scale of what we're up against. The current environmental crisis isn't a singular issue. It brings together a constellation of different challenges, economics, policy, culture, and now evident global health. Climate change is inextricably linked to racial justice, to migration, and to fair housing. It touches on development and opportunities and we know that it cost, like those of the COVID pandemic. Low income communities and communities of color are uniquely vulnerable to the threats of climate change and both here and around the world. To me, this is the civil rights movement of the 21st century. And I am struck now by how the words of one of my favorite authors, James Baldwin, speak so powerfully of this moment. He said, there is never a time in the future to work out our salvation. The challenge is in the moment. The time is always now. I think Baldwin had it right. We can't afford the wait. The challenges of this moment require us to come together, create cross boundaries, disciplines, and generations, to cut through conventional boundaries, 
to create a shared vision of hope for our future. That's exactly what makes the Smithsonian so uniquely situated to lead this charge. We have an opportunity to harness the strength of the institution's research, programs, education, and convening capacity. And with this opportunity comes a responsibility to ensure that all stakeholders have a seat at the table and a voice at crafting the solutions. Because we know that we can encourage diverse perspectives, we are at our best. That is what this summit is all about bringing together an extraordinary group of people from different fields and different backgrounds. We are excited to have you here and can't wait to see where this conversation takes us. We're here today thanks to the hard work of so many. I am awed by the perseverance and the flexibility of our Earth Optimism team and the Smithsonian Conservation Commons, led by Ruth Stoke. Let me also recognize the vision and guidance of Nancy Knowlton, whose idea this first was, and Steve Mumford for his transformable leadership in these efforts. Thank you all for making this happen. In times of personal crisis, it seems to me cultural institutions have always been sources of hope and healing. Our planet faces the challenge of a lifetime. Let's work together to imbue our future with all the hope and healing that, and creativity that we have to offer. Thank you and good luck with the rest of the program. To help us remember and celebrate the 50th anniversary of Earth Day, please welcome our first moderator, CNN anchor and chief climate correspondent, Bill Weir. Greetings, Earth lovers. Uh, I am Bill Weir, chief climate correspondent uh, and coverer of the state of life as we know it for a little network called CNN. And it is my great honor to moderate a couple uh, panels here uh, for the Earth Optimist Summit. Uh, I was speaking to a climate scientist yesterday who said something that really stuck with me, which is uh, Dr. Martin Luther King didn't say, I have a nightmare. He said, I have a dream. And uh, we can talk about nightmares all day. We want to discuss the, the latest scientific papers and the predictions for what's happening to our blue marble. But it's so great to talk about the dream of a better path forward for all of us. And uh, on this Earth Week, the golden anniversary of Earth Week, it is my great honor to welcome sort of an OG in this movement and one of the no, new young guard. Uh, Dennis Hayes was one of the principal national organizers, the principal national organizer for the very first Earth Day in 1970. He is the president of the Bullet Foundation. Hello, Dennis. Great to see you, sir. Hey, good to see you again, Bill. All right. And then also joining us is the founder and co-executive director of Zero Hour. Uh, I've, I've had the pleasure of talking to this young lady both uh, on the streets of New York during climate marches and in Washington as she testifies before Congress, Jamie Margolin. Hi, Jamie. How are you? Hi, I'm well. Thank you for having me. Oh, our pleasure, our pleasure. So I'm hoping to have a robust conversation, get perspective both on Earth Day then and now. But Dennis, let's let's go back in time. Uh, tell us, take us back to the days of, of forming that very first Earth Day. I'm a Wisconsin boy, I think you are too. Senator Gaylord Nelson was looking for a way to, to teach people about what we were doing to our planet. And the, the out, the reaction was incredible. 20 million people, I understand, took to the streets. It was like 10% of the population back then. What what worked then, and how do you regard the progress or lack thereof in the half century since? Um, well, it was a spectacular event, and um, all sorts of diverse groups did all sorts of diverse things in literally every city, town, um, village crossroads across the land and they basically were demanding uh, fundamental changes in the way that the country does business and, and a look for optimism I, i'm guessing you could find some from the fact that um, this grassroots movement with very little support in the administration and limited support in congress uh, though gaylord was certainly a champion from the very beginning uh, it managed to pass a Clean Air Act, a Clean Water Act, uh, an Endangered Species Act, a Marine Mammal Protection Act, 
uh, Toxic Substances Control Act, uh, Superfund, National Environmental Education Act, National Forest Protection Act, and on and on in the course of about six or seven years. Uh, it, it was a spectacular change in, in a nation that had been economically prospering, but at enormous cost to the quality of its air, its water, and its land. Right. And it seems like, you know, it was the air and the water got too foul to ignore for everyday people uh, at the time. And, you know, in hindsight, it's, it's kind of stunning politically to think Richard Nixon was the president who gave us all of those environmental uh, acts as well. And but 75 percent of greenhouse gas emissions have come since since then, a, a problem that's harder to see uh, with the naked eye, but is, is going to be increasingly uh, obvious as storms and, and floods and the events of a, of a warmer, out-of-control planet uh, go on. Jamie, what, what is it that motivated you? Uh, since we don't have you know, mountains of garbage and you can't taste the air in Los Angeles and there aren't rivers on fire like there were back in, in 1970, what was Sorry. it that, that inspired you to start Zero Hour? Um, I think, okay, it sounds weird to say existential dread, but that's kind of what was the initial, there were many motivating factors, but you have to understand, I was born after 9-11. So not only has like, you know, the TSA and, and like, you know, the kind of surveillance state always been a reality for me, but so is the fact that life as we know it on this planet is um, highly in danger and potentially coming to an end because of the climate crisis. This was, by the time I was, by the time I, uh, an inconvenient truth came out. I was like a toddler. So that information about the climate crisis has just always been common knowledge when I was growing up. I mean, I'm still growing up, but when I was like really little. Um, and so it wasn't like I, I had an aha moment where I first learned about the climate crisis and then I was like, oh, wow, this is real. It was just kind of something that was always there, you know, like it was just something that that's just always been there. And so really for me, it wasn't about learning about the climate crisis and then taking action. It was about collectively ingesting this information and having it be a common knowledge amongst our generation that everything is coming to an end and is temporary. Any beauty that we have, I, like seeing nature documentaries ever since I was little was always like super bittersweet because it was never like, oh, look at that cool dolphin. It was like, oh, that's probably endangered. And that was just the norm. And my friends and I would be talking in school, oh, what do you want to be when you grow up? Oh, I want to do this if the climate crisis won't destroy that by then. It was just ifs, uh, just growing up with like if, maybe, if, you know, like there, there was no, we're constantly being asked to plan for our future as my generation, but then um, that future isn't actually being left for us. And even the present is currently being destroyed because the climate crisis is not a problem of the future. It's already here. And Eventually, um, all of this like rage and worry culminated in the 2016 election, which was I was 14 years old. And that's really when I first started to get involved um, outside of just, you know, doing school projects about issues. I was that I was a volunteer for my local Democratic campaign headquarters that didn't work out. And then I really started like organizing a lot locally in my community of Seattle, doing the best I could, running around uh, Olympia, testifying at bill hearings, um, trying to get bills signed, trying to get bills passed, joining a lawsuit suing the Washington state government over denying my generation our constitutional rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness by continually making um, the climate crisis worse. And it was just all these actions. And so I was just, my freshman year of high school, I was just constantly on the go in terms of trying to take climate action. But nothing was really happening. And I thought, you know, I was under the misconception that Democrat equals automatically good on climate. And I realized that just because you're not a climate denier doesn't mean you're actually good on climate. And I learned the hard way after trying to deal with many politicians who kept saying one thing and then doing another thing. Um, and so around the summer of 2017, there was massive wildfires in Southern Canada and California. And Seattle was like sandwiched in that. And a lot of the wildfire smoke from Canada blew over the city and covered us in like a very thick layer of smog. I don't have any respiratory conditions, but it was still hard for me to breathe and gave me migraines. So imagine what it was like for people with actual asthma and respiratory conditions. Like, and then on top of that, Hurricane Maria hit Trump. Uh, announced that he was pulling us out of the Paris Climate Accords, um, Hurricane Harvey hit, and it was just all these climate disasters. And the media was like, what a large hurricane. What a coincidence. Oh, another climate disaster. What a coincidence. And they weren't drawing the lines or connecting it to the climate crisis. And I was like, 
okay, something is seriously wrong. I, I want to do like a big youth climate mobilization. I want to start a youth climate march. And so I posted on my social media, I'm going to start a youth climate march. Who's with me? I got a couple of responses from kids around the country. And from then on, we started zero hour and we started organizing and the rest is history. Right. Uh, Dennis, back in 1970, you had to rely on speeches and media to get the message out to organize folks. Things have changed so much in how we communicate now. Uh, do you think it's how do you regard those differences now with the online platforms but that also come with a steady dose of misinformation? I, I think you've hit the two big points. Um, one, it is vastly easier now for uh, particularly digital natives like Jamie to communicate with people in uh, other continents and to build uh, a movement that, that, that literally uh, can happen overnight. Um, you, you send out a message and it is in somebody's uh, inbox uh, a nanosecond later. With us, we would work with reporters to try to get articles in newspapers and magazines or on television, uh, beg them to put our street address at the bottom of their articles. And when they wanted to do that, then have worked with them to beg their <laughs> editors to allow it to remain. And, and then people would write to us, and some of them turned out to be great organizers, some of them turned out to be really just great writers and sort of a waste of time in terms of putting together an event. So we sent out regional organizers to try to ground truth who was real, who was not, and who could actually put together something big in, in New York and Chicago and Philadelphia and Los Angeles and San Francisco. And in the end, um, <laughs> you know, uh, instead of email, what we would do is take their uh, street addresses, punch them out into metal plates in an addressograph machine, hand crank the addressograph machine as we were feeding envelopes through it, get 50 or 60,000 envelopes and put our newsletters in it, stick them in the mail. We'd bring in volunteers to, to handle all of this stuff and to stamp them, send them out, and five or six days later, somebody on the other side of the country would get the latest missive from us. Uh, it, it is just a totally different world today. On the other hand, we did have intermediaries like you who were out there then uh, examining the stories that were in front of them, figuring out what's true, what's not true, and, and doing a job of reporting through what were really then three commercial networks and one public broadcasting network, unlike the, uh, the 50,000 <laughs> different things that are out there streaming today, often with, with grotesque misinformation in them. Yeah. Yeah. I can't imagine. You know, it, it, the, the parallels that, between that the coronavirus. Oh, sorry, hey, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. No, Jamie. I was sorry just saying, like, I can't imagine what it's like. No, no, it's fine. I was just saying that I can't imagine what it's like not having the internet to organize because so much of my organizing, it's not that I'm just sitting there tweeting all day. I do the real, I, I do like work in person, but it's just like, the internet and like different facets and, and abilities that it gives me like it's just such a crucial part of organizing like all of zero hour members are from all over the country so we meet via zoom um email group chats everything like so much of the organizing is digital and that makes it a lot more accessible to a lot of people so i really can't imagine like what organizing is like without the internet and i know people have been doing it long before the internet and it's not that i'm just like you know, like the organizing that people are doing today is still real and still impacting people. It's just, I can't, it's so like, I can't even like imagine like how would I have done any of what I did without the internet? So, I mean, completely different world. For sure. For sure. But, but let me ask you this. I mean, today, sadly, one of the, one of the many curses of this, of this virus is at a time when we need human connection more than ever, we can't even see each other smile because of the masks and we can't shake hands anymore and we certainly can't march in the streets. I wonder, Dennis, if you think Earth Day yeah. would exist and all of Clean Air and Water Act would exist if 20 million people didn't get in the streets. And Jamie, now that you can't uh, do that, do you think digital organization will have the same punch as, as 100,000 people marching down Pennsylvania Avenue? Well, to take that first Dennis, question, if, if COVID nineteen had if, if COVID nineteen had landed um, 
a month or two before the first Earth Day, uh, we, we would not have had a digital platform to fall back on. And if there had not been massive crowds demanding change, yeah, the, the political impact that defeated a dirty dozen that, that persuaded, candidly, a somewhat anti-environmental president. People have forgotten Richard Nixon actually vetoed the Clean Water Act and was so overwhelmingly overturned by Congress that he never questioned any other um, things. It, it was the, the grassroots that, that caused this to happen. And uh, yeah, no, the, the impact of something that caused us to shelter in place would have been just devastating. Uh, um, I, I would like to, during the time that we have here, a little bit off the topic of what you're talking about, though, say that the problems that we are facing today, the, the global and international ones that are much tougher to address than things where Congress can pass a law and the Department of Justice and the EPA can enforce it. And if they don't, we can have citizen suits to enforce it. Working internationally, there is no equivalent to that. And, and I think COVID-19 is, is calling our attention to that fairly dramatically. Uh, the decision by the United States to cut off funding for the World Health Organization seems to me not to be one of the smarter moves that we could possibly have made at this moment in time. And that there are genuine experts out there to which we ought to give some deference at places, again, like WHO, like the Centers for Disease Control, and their equivalents in the climate arena. Uh, there's been this tendency just not to trust expertise. And in fact, if people have devoted their lives to studying something, they deserve to be listened to. I guess yeah, also I mean, to they, answer they've your been question. Virologists um, warned us for a long time if we devoured everything in the jungle in the jungle, it would come back to haunt us. Climatologists are warning us of the same thing. I'm sorry to step on you, Jamie. Yeah, to my question to you, how does zero hour yeah. remain impactful and what changes can you get if you can't have a physical presence? So, you know, I think digital organizing, actually, it does have a, a massive presence. Like right now, Earth Day Live has been streaming all over the world since yesterday, and it's gonna be streaming through tomorrow. And I think that you know, people often um, brush off digital organizing as meaningless and not doing anything. But the sense of community that it brings, the, the ability to spread awareness, the ability to put pressure on people using digital platforms is massive. And I do think that we can still have a big impact digitally. It's not the same as going into communities and, you know, doing work and things like that or working within our own communities, blah, 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 or marching in the streets. And, and I'm not going to pretend that I can replace it. But digital organizing is very, very impactful and meaningful and shouldn't be overlooked. Um, what Zero Hour is doing, I mean, we recently launched a campaign called Getting to the Roots of Climate Change, where we talk about the root systems of oppression that caused the climate crisis in the first place. And um, we're doing webinars twice a day, every Friday, talking about, you know, how different systems intertwine with the climate crisis. We have a different theme each week. So last week's theme was colonialism, and we talked about colonization and the climate crisis, and we held webinars about it. We also did, like, Instagram live streams, different graphics and animations, um, also, like, Arts is a lot more accessible now due to like social media. You can download Photoshop. We have a lot of great young graphic designers on our team who make really cool like animations and things like that. We are able to record a podcast um, from our living rooms. And so we started a podcast that is on Spotify and Google Play and all of the podcast places. It's called Zero Hour Talks. And we're able to communicate with people through podcasts, through um through webinars, through live streams, through graphics, through tweets, through everything, really communicating the message and spreading the awareness that needs to be spread. And then um, once you know the, the virus is over, people will have that knowledge and then we'll be able to go back to organizing in person. But we've really been able to harness the, the power of digital organizing as digital natives um, who have had these tools our whole lives and really know how to use them. Right, and I know you have a book coming out called Youth to Power on June 2nd. Can't can't wait to read that. But we have uh, just a couple minutes left. So, Dennis, I think um, people crave sort of actionable uh, advice for, for those motivated enough to watch this and want to know how they can enact better change. Given your experience, what, what do you tell them? Well, I think tying together many of the things that Jamie has said as well about what's possible on the internet. We, we need to 
Remember that when you're talking about large crowd events, uh, you're really talking about political impact, and there are other impacts that are also important. Um, you know, we we streamed the Pope making his comment yesterday. He had originally intended to do it to a crowd of that, that filled up St. Peter's Square in Rome, and then that became illegal, so he put it online for us. Uh, we had intended to have 750,000 people on the National Mall in Washington, D.C. It's now illegal to have a group larger than 10, and 10 doesn't have much political impact. But in solving the climate crisis, over and beyond the policy changes, the incentives, the regulations, the government procurement efforts, the various elements of a Green New Deal, um, there are roles for architects, roles for engineers, and for scientists, and for economists, and for business people, and for labor leaders, and for student activists. And all of those things can be communicated very effectively, even when we are all sheltering at home. They can be motivated to do things that are different in their own jobs and in their own lives. And if they're talking about actionable things, there are changes that when you're aggregating them times, you know, nearly 8 billion people around the world, if we eat lower on the food chain and go increasingly to vegetarian, organic, local materials, uh, to the extent that we don't have mansions, but we have houses that are appropriate to our needs, to the extent that we choose the most energy efficient transportation systems possible, to the extent that we simply think about the climate impact and environmental impact of every aspect of our lives and try to make that as small a footprint as possible because of the desire to leave a better world for our children. Uh, the, the array of things that, that yeah. can be done simply by things as small as buying the most energy efficient refrigerator, the most energy efficient television, most energy efficient washing machine, really add up. I hey, believe all, all someone of our with little a decisions final thought. Of... Well, Dennis Hayes. Yeah. Okay, please. Oh yeah, I guess the final thought, if people want to get involved with more digital organizing and join Zero Hour, I guess I just want to give people a place if you want to plug into the work that we do. You can just follow us on social media. It's just at This Is Zero Hour on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, and you'll get our um, live streams and uh, webinar links, et cetera, if you want to plug in. Um, even though we are youth-led, um, we are an intergenerational movement, and anyone of all ages is welcome to tune in. So we'd love to have you. Very good. Uh, Jamie Margolin from Zero Hour, Dennis Hayes of the Bullet Foundation. It was great spending time with you. Happy Earth Day. Thank you. Happy Earth Day. You too, Bill. Thanks for having us. These cheetah cubs represent an amazing scientific breakthrough. They are the first cheetah cubs ever produced by embryo transfer in this species. My name is Adrienne Crozier and I research our cheetah population here at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. The mother of the cheetahs is Isabella, but she's not the biological mother of the cheetahs. The biological mother is Kabibi. We use sperm from a male living at the Fossil Rim Wildlife Center in Texas. His name is Slash. And so the parents of these cubs are actually Kabibi and Slash. And Isabella was the surrogate that carried the cubs throughout pregnancy. We worked very closely with the Columbus Zoo and also the Fossil Rim Wildlife Center. She, in my opinion, is the most valuable cheetah in the world because she successfully carried two cubs to term. And this is a cheetah that you would never breed her. You would not want her genetic line to continue. It's overrepresented. But the babies came from the very valuable cheetah genetically. It's an amazing demonstration of working across facilities and generating an amazing success story. 
Cheetahs as a species had a huge die off about 10,000 years ago, and that resulted in a very small, limited gene pool, which makes it susceptible to a lot of diseases and pathogens. The animals in our care are so important because we can study their biology, and then we can use the tools that we have to try to maximize the genetic health of our population. We've spent a lot of time studying the natural breeding of the species, and we've made great strides in improving natural reproduction, but there is still a subset of animals that are unable to breed on their own because of age or health or other limiting factors. This technique gives us the ability to reproduce those individuals that are unable to breed naturally. This assisted breeding technique is a critical tool in our toolbox to improve and maximize the genetic health of all cheetahs. Fertility in cheetahs is pretty complex. My name is Pierre Comizzoli. I am a research veterinarian at the Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute. The different steps that we are following for the cheetahs are exactly like the same steps that are used in human fertility. We collect the eggs, we fertilize them in vitro. It's like uh, producing test tube babies. And then after that, those young embryos are transferred into a surrogate mother, a different mother. This is the first time this is really successful, so we are very excited. This is the science that could save that species in the wild. All of our decades of research that have gone into improving the genetic health of cheetahs ultimately will help us save the species. And now, to give us perspective from space, please welcome the John and Adrian Mars Director's Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, Ellen Stofan. Good afternoon. I'm Ellen Stofan, the John and Adrian Mars Director of the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. It's great to still be able to carry on with our Earth Optimism Summit at this difficult time as the world comes together to address one truly global crisis and we work hard to confront this threat, perhaps we can learn some valuable lessons for how we can work as one on the crisis of global climate change. And if there's one thing that we keep hearing about as the foundation for addressing COVID-19 that's equally applicable to climate, it's having the data to make sound decisions. When Apollo 8 took the first humans to the moon and gave them that amazing view back at our, our fragile blue planet, astronaut Bill Anders said, we came all this way to explore the moon and the most important thing is that we discovered the earth. While his words are poetic, we'd actually started discovering the earth from space more than a decade before. The very first humanly built heavenly body, Sputnik in 1957 transmitted transmitted radio signals that the Soviets used to measure the ionosphere. Three years later, the U.S. launched the first satellite built specifically for Earth observation, TIROS-1, taking a huge step forward in weather forecasting. As the sophistication of our technology to study our home from the ground, air, and space has grown, so have our earthly challenges. Initially, we wanted to know the fundamental, fundamentals of how our planet worked. What we've now learned is that we are changing those fundamental processes, altering over the course of decades systems that have developed over millions of years. So we need even more and better data, consistent data to address that impact. As a planetary geologist, as in planets other than our own, I have to mention that we also add to that knowledge by looking outward. Uh, by studying our neighbors in the solar system to understand the basic science behind how planets work. And that feeds back into the questions that we ask and the data that we collect to help us find answers. Unfortunately, the data that we continue to gather on our one and only home is frankly grim. We have found time and again that things are moving in the wrong direction and faster than our predictions and models have told us that they would. That can make it hard to be optimistic. But, you know, I grew up in a part of Ohio where a major river caught fire and Lake Erie was declared dead by some. Facing those realities helped begin the movement 50 years ago that we're celebrating now. And today the river and the lake have been at least partially restored. It is possible to change course and stem the tide of environmental damage 
if we confront the challenge head on. That's why I'm optimistic. We know that with informed, unified, innovative action, we're capable of anything, including saving the beautiful spaceship Earth that is our unique home. I believe that the growing volume, better quality, and more definitive data we're gathering today by NASA and NOAA observing Earth from air and space can have the same galvanizing impact. So let's take a look at the amazing evolution of how NASA has looked at and learned about ourselves from high above. Just prior to the subsolar point on the south side and the floor of it, uh, in the evening, there is one dark hole. Oh my God, look at that picture over there. There's the earth coming up. Wow, is that pretty? This short grass prairie is a world-class ecosystem. We have as many important ecosystems here in North America, as many important iconic species like bison that we need to protect right here. American Prairie Reserve is working to build the largest wildlife reserve in the lower 48 states. That landscape is surprisingly much more diverse than people would typically think of the prairie. And we still have many of the species that were there historically, but just in low abundance. Now we're ready to start the restoration. So we look for science partners to help us with that. Smithsonian Conservation Biology Institute was a natural collaboration. We have a lot of expertise in grassland ecosystems around the world. We have a lot of expertise in large mammal ecology. All that expertise we can apply to this one place. That's part of our project here. How can we make a sustainable ecosystem? It has a lot of the parts that it needs and it has a lot of the people that are dedicated to this project and want to make it work. To help us imagine the future, we welcome our next moderator, the co-founder and co-executive chairman, the Carlisle Group and Smithsonian Board of Regents, David Rubenstein. Hello, this is David Rubenstein, and I am privileged today to be able to have a discussion with two extraordinary individuals. Let me just briefly introduce them. We'll go into a dis discussion that we're gonna have over the next 20 minutes. First is Jose Andres. Jose is one of the world's leading chefs, of course. He's also one of the leading.
he is coming to us from his uh, base in Bethesda, Maryland, which is where, actually where I am today right now as well. We're also here with Christiana Figures, uh, if I pronounce that correctly. And Christiana is, are you in Costa Rica at the moment? You are in Costa Rica. I she am, is a uh, person who is, yes. She is the person who is the most responsible for putting together the Paris Agreement that led to the uh, famous accord uh, relating to global climate change. She was then the executive secretary for the association uh, that put that together. She is a terrific uh, uh, spokesman for the need for global climate change, and she's devoted the most, most of her life in recent years to that. So let me ask both of you a question at the beginning. Jose, as a result of the COVID-19 crisis, um, how have you had to step up your efforts to feed people, particularly in a country that you probably never thought you had to do that before, the United States? Uh, we began early on uh, in Japan, in Yokohama, helping the Japanese government and the Princess cruise ship, uh, feeding 18,000 meals a day to the 6,000 people we follow in Auckland. So very early on, we saw that this was coming. So what we did was understanding, watching what happened in China, what was happening in Italy, what was happening in Spain, that this was going to hit America hard and that the restaurants were going to be closing and many businesses, many people unemployed. We already have 40 million people that they are food insecure. We knew that we were going to be adding many more millions and that the systems were going to be maxed out. So what we did is to start establishing a protocol to try to reach as many hungry people and in need as we could. Right now we are feeding elderly, we are feeding hospitals, uh, homeless, uh, low-income families, all of the above, mm -hmm. using what is in place, restaurants. We are partnering with more than 500 restaurants to reach everywhere in America where people need a plate of food. Now, uh, Jose, um, you uh, have started the World Central Kitchen, which is the vehicle for which you do much of this. But the U.S. government is handing out trillions of dollars for food and for, I mean, for other things. Are they handing out any money to you to help fund some of what you're doing? Uh, no, everything we are doing is through philanthropy from people give us one dollar to other people that they are giving us millions. Uh, good, generous citizens that they came to support what we do best which is food distribution. I think the government lacks something essential, recognizing that this is a humanitarian crisis and putting somebody in charge, recognizing that lack of food is a national security issue. And I do believe we need to be taking food in this moment, once and for all, more seriously. Right now it's food banks, they cannot get rice and beans. Uh, uh, do I foresee a big problem in the weeks and months to come? I think we'll be okay, but I'm worried that things may get worse before they get any better. A final question before I go to Christiana is this. Um, Jose, if somebody wants to send you money, uh, how do they do that if they want to fund what you're doing? Well, um, it's a few ways to do that, but the easiest way is going to the WCK.org webpage, and there you can see what we do. We are in more than 96 cities. We are partnering with different people, and there you're going to see that before you even send us the money, the money is already going out to feed people in need. Okay. So, Christiana, let me ask you, um, since the COVID-19 crisis has taken over the world, we now see what the world looks like when people are staying at home and the, uh, the atmosphere seems cleaner. Um, how can we get pictures of this to remind people all the time in the future how clean the air can be if we don't use so much carbon? Well, thanks for the invitation today, David and Jose. Very good to see you again under very different circumstances to the last time that we were together. Uh, now, David, to your question. Right. Uh, it is a question that has to be dealt very carefully because, yes, it is true that as we have been removing human pressure and presence, from uh, everywhere. Uh, yes, we have cleaner air, we have cleaner water, we have more animals that are returning even to urban spaces, and people are really recognizing the difference in their environment, which is a nice difference. 
However, let us be very careful from saying that this is the way that we want to address climate change. We cannot address climate change. We cannot decarbonize the economy at the horrific cost of thousands of human lives, of millions of people who have lost their livelihoods, lost their jobs, lost their access to food, as Jose has already told us. This is not the way that we decarbonize and address climate change. Quite to the contrary, decarbonization that is intentional, that is well planned, does not have the improvement of the environment as an unintended consequence and furthermore as a temporary consequence. Decarbonization that is serious actually has an improvement of the environment that is long lasting, but more importantly, it actually leads to a safer, more stable economy in and to better well-being of everyone. Okay. Now, if you were able to do the Paris Accord all over again, uh, is there anything that you would have put in the Paris Agreement that is not in, and how would you have done something differently uh, that led to the Paris Agreement? Any changes, or was it perfect as it, as it was put together? Well, there's nothing perfect in my marginal improvement uh, would have made it substantially different or better. The fact is that the agreement stands there and it will accompany evolution economy for several decades to come. What is important now is to realize that the health crisis has actually collided with the climate change crisis. Both of these are now coming at the same time. And the conditions under which many people are trying to survive is a page out of the worst impacts of climate change that we will have if we don't meet the climate crisis. So because these two crises have collided against each other, we have an incredible responsibility for to make the solutions to both coherent and converging. This is the moment to put in the green recovery packages that will address the lo lock, lack, loss of jobs that so many people are having and the hunger that Jose has been speaking about, put them back to work, give them back their integrity of life, and do so in workplaces and in industries that are long lasting and that will guarantee a job for a long time, a clean, safe, resilient economy. Now, very many people follow the lead of the Paris Agreement and say, by the year 2050, we're gonna achieve certain goals. But in the year 2050, I'll be 101 years old. So I'm not as focused on things in 2050. Why can't I get better, um, I'd say, climate change before 2050. Why did you pick 2050? It's so far away. 2050 is very far away. Uh, and you will be 101, but my grandfather lived until he was 105. So David, you stand a good chance of still being with us. So you shouldn't put this off and say it's beyond your lifetime. The fact is that we're all living longer. And it is definitely within the lifetime of all of our descendants, our children and our grandchildren. Yet, it is a long-term effort. Now, the reason why it's important to have a long-term goal is precisely because it determines what the shorter-term goals are. So we do have a final goal of no more emissions by 2050, but in order to get there, it's sort of like running a marathon, you don't run it all of all of a sudden. You train for it, and you have points during uh, uh, throughout the course in which you check in to make sure that you're staying on course. The first check-in point to make sure that we are staying on course is actually precisely this decade that we're just starting right now. By 2030, we have to be at already one half the emissions that we have right now. And in order for that to be the case, this is the year in which we have to start to descend the emissions. And they will because of the coronavirus uh, crisis. That is not a sustained uh, answer to climate change. Yes, we will harvest these reduction of emissions. But as I say, it comes at too much of a human cost. And we have to be able to make the changes in the economy 
toward more carbon efficiency so that we can have sustained reductions and improved well-being worldwide. Oh, I think uh, you have better genes than me, so you're more likely to make it to 100 than I am. But anyway, Jose, let me ask you a question. Um, you're a world famous chef. You have 31 restaurants in various parts of the world. And you're a great chef because I've had dinner at your house where you cooked the dinner and it was great. Um, why don't you just stick to being a chef? Why don't you decide to, to do this? Um, isn't being a chef, uh, a world-class chef enough for you? Why do you have to take on this humanitarian crisis? What prompted you to do this? Because I saw that the system was lacking uh, real response for emergencies. Uh, the last moment was Bahamas. Uh, more than 80,000 people in Bahamas were affected by Dorian. It was not for World Central Kitchen, who was going to be there to feed the people. We got there first. We arrived 10 days before any of the big organization. We were not even supposed to be there. And at the end, we reached 70,000 meals a day in less than five days. 14th Islands, you need an organization like World Central Kitchen. When you need to provide uh, medical after emergencies, you send doctors and nurses. When you need to do reconstruction, you send architects. Well, when you need to feed the people, why you don't send the best people to feed the people? Those are cooks like me. So that's why I decided to do it. I want to feed the few. I want to have a three-star Michelin. But also, I need to feed the many. Because if not, my community will not do well if around where I live, everybody else is doing bad. I do believe the new American dream, the new dream for the world needs to be, I need to provide for myself and my family, but I need to fight also to provide for the people I don't know the same things I'm claiming for myself. That's the only way forward. That's why I do what I do, to feed the few, but also to make sure we are able to feed the many. Well, you're doing great humanitarian things. People want to make sure your health is good. So what are you doing to make sure you don't get COVID-19? How are you dealing with social distancing? Are you staying in your home now? What are you doing to make yourself healthy and make sure you can live to 100 as well? Well, I've been traveling around. I just came back from Queens, Bronx, uh, New York. I'm on my way to Newark. I've been going around Virginia, Maryland, D.C. I have to do it. I keep my family safe. But they have to be there. Somebody has to be feeding the people. We are hundreds, if not thousands of people across America feeding people in need. Uh, There's no way we can use to stay home. Some people have to be feeding the people fighting this virus. So it's my, my role. It's my little contribution. Uh, why I, I am protected and our teams, we were the first organization to do HACCP, to do the right health protocols to protect everybody. My restaurants, when they change to community kitchens, we put big round circles with messaging and making sure everybody will be six feet away and telling everybody what to do. So we've been in the forefront now for months and so far so good. I know some of my people eventually maybe will get sick. Many of them, everybody's volunteer. They do this because they want to, but we've been following protocols so well since Yokohama, since Oakland feeding entire cruise ships with coronavirus. Our teams were protected at all times because we follow the, 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 the right protocols, the right guidelines. And so far, um, we've, been, we've been very lucky. Okay, so now you have, I think I got the number right around roughly 31 restaurants. I presume most of them, if not all are closed now. What happened to your employees and will you be able to open these restaurants again or are these restaurants like other restaurants around the United States not going to open again? So of the 31 restaurants, 16 are restaurants Thin Food Group uh, owns personally. The other ones are with other uh, partners, hotels and, and universities and others. Uh, the 1,600 employees that directly depend uh, from me, from Thin Food Group, we were able to be uh, covering more than five weeks of full salary and full benefit. Why we did that? Because it's what I had to do. I had to be there for them because they've been there for me. Uh, this has been a very smart way for us. 
because I didn't want to put extra anxieties on the shoulders of those men and women that they worked so hard to help me have the company I have. So now I think that we need to all to be taking care of the health crisis, at the same time, the humanitarian crisis, and maybe Congress has not been uh, uh, the best at implementing a plan. I think they were supposed to be kind of doing it different. They were supposed to put the money for reopening, making sure that everybody will be paid the salary, making sure that everybody will be okay, maybe move leases and rents and debts, leave it forward into the future and make sure every employee will be fine across America and then invest money to reopen America. We'll see what happens. I hope that restaurant industry will be part of the reopening of the economy, the reopening of America. I'm getting myself ready to do that, but first, I need to make sure that we take care of the health crisis and second of the humanitarian crisis. If we do that, the economy will go up on its own. All right, Christiana, let me finish with you. Um, what is the major lesson you have learned from your efforts in um, dealing with climate change? And over the years you've been working on it, uh, what is the major lesson you have learned and you would convey to other people? Well, you know, amazingly, there are many lessons to be learned from this COVID crisis that are applicable to climate change and to many other uh, challenges that we are already and will be in the future dealing with. One, of course, is the tautological learning uh, that a global challenge is, in fact, global, that there is no such thing as some people are going to be affected and I'm going to be exempted. As Jose has already said, He's feeling this, he's feeding the some, but he also has to feed the many. And that is a very clear example of the fact that we, each of us, are as vulnerable as the most vulnerable person. So the fact that global challenges are global and that we have to leave no one behind, that all of our policies and our actions have to be inclusive, that is true of the recovery from the COVID crisis. It's also true of climate change. The other big lesson that we are learning here um, is that there are that dealing with challenges like this requires both systemic measures, such as the ones that governments have already put in place for COVID crisis, also for climate change, but that it also requires individual behavior changes. And how many times were we told that? We humans are creatures of habit that we cannot change our behavior. Well, I will have you know, we have definitely changed our behavior in just a matter of weeks. One and end, we have to always combine the systemic with the individual behavioral changes. The one behavior change that I hope is going to be sticky beyond the uh, health crisis is the fact that we're all traveling less. We have all learned to use these video conferencing technologies a little bit better than before. And I think once this is over, we will all learn that actually it's not as perfect as being there in person. And you certainly can to cook over the screen, but there are many messages that can be delivered and many opinions that can be exchanged over a video screen. And I do think that travel is not going to return to the levels that we had, certainly not business travel. It is also very possible that the way that we organize office space will be quite different. So we will have certain behavioral changes that have been put in place for this crisis that will be in place even after we come out of this crisis. And in fact, that will help climate change. All right, in one word for both of you, are you optimistic about the future or are you pessimistic? Jose, are you optimistic about the future? Uh, of the earth or pessimistic? Uh, pragmatic, optimistic. Optimistic, okay. And, and my and brand Christiana, are you optimistic or pessimistic? I am stubbornly optimistic because I want to insist, I want to be gritty, I want to be determined that we are going to get out of this and out of anything else that is thrown our way. I have deep faith in humanity. All right. All right. Thank you both. We are out of time and I look forward to having a meal with you, Jose and Christiana together sometime when we can talk about this in more detail. Thank you very much. is
better with forests. Need proof? You'll find plenty in your science. Or you could just see for yourself. Forests bring us rain, rivers, water, the very air we breathe. They keep us cool, and not just people. The whole planet. People need forests. And now, more than ever, forests need people. Forests are the fastest, cheapest climate solution. Better with forests.